Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. So in my last video I said that I was suffering from some writer's block and I asked for a few suggestions and a user named DosSec said maybe you can list some good horror movies, I would appreciate it. So I thought that sounded like a quite good idea, might be a fun thing to do. I'd, I have been doing a series recently on my favourite found footage movies, but I thought maybe covering some of the horror movies that aren't found footage might also be a good idea. So uh, I'll pick five random horror movies that I enjoy, and then if people like this video I'll do a, maybe some more in the future where I pick another five and talk about them. I'm not writing a script like I normally do for my videos, I'm just sort of speaking off the top of my head, so I might make some mistakes, but anyway. I guess one of my favourite horror series is the uh, George Romero's zombie movies, the three classic ones, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead, and I wanted to pick one of those, and I was kind of torn between the three because on one hand I really like the sort of indie vibes of the Night of the Living Dead, and it's probably one of the horror movies that I've watched the most times over because, I don't know, I really like that movie and I've, I've just seen it so many times but it's actually quite slow and some of the characters are really annoying. But out of Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead, I'm not too sure. See, the thing is, I really like Day of the Dead because, um, well, I think it shows the kind of societal collapse much more, the kind of paranoia that will set in between people. I think it's got a really good claustrophobic atmosphere, all these people trapped in a bunker together and how it sort of starts to affect their brains and makes them all start acting crazy and paranoid. I really like these apocalyptic stories where you kind of get a good idea of the, the kind of mental strain it has on the people going through it. Uh, I really like the books of J.G. Ballard. He does a really good job conveying that. So I think Day of the Dead does a better job of that, and I really like the claustrophobic atmosphere of it. But for pure satisfying viewing, I've got to pick Dawn of the Dead as my favourite of the three. It's kind of like everyone's fantasy of what they would do in a zombie apocalypse. It's the idea of going to a shopping mall, kicking out all the zombies, taking it over and sort of turning it into a fortress where you fend off zombies and attackers from within and inside it's got everything you'll ever need, all the food and weapons and everything you'll need. I just love the, the whole look of the movie, the weird cheap looking blue zombies and the gore effects. I think like the gore effects are a lot better in Day of the Dead but in Dawn of the Dead they've got that kind of almost hammer horror type of vibe. The blood is bright red, it looks kind of like paint and I don't know, I just love the whole journey of the movie from the opening scenes where they're in that weird apartment complex that's full of zombies to escaping in a helicopter and ending up in the shopping mall and how they work to take over the, over the place. Purely from it being a satisfying and enjoyable watch, I think Dawn of the Dead is probably my favourite of the three. So, yeah, as a pick, I'm going to say Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, there's something about Dawn of the Dead. It's like the default of zombie movies, Dawn of the Dead. It's, it's the ultimate classic, I think. Yeah, every other zombie movie sort of looks to that one to try and emulate what they did. And uh, I'm not sure if it's been done better. So for my second choice, I'm going to go a bit more recent. I'm going to pick the 2015 film The Witch. This film just kind of came out of nowhere for me. I didn't know anything about it. I just happened to catch it on Netflix. I wasn't really sure what it was, and I was so surprised by it. There's so many bad horror films on Netflix, especially the modern ones they put on there, that this completely took me by surprise, and it was a very pleasant surprise. For a start, I don't think as many period horrors made these days. I think that the idea of like a period horror movie is something that was much more popular back in the sort of classic era of horror movies, going from the Universal Monster movies up to Hammer Horror and that kind of era. I think nowadays there's much more focus on making a, a modern horror set in modern times and for the viewer it's more relatable. You'll feel more scared if you feel like it's something that could happen to you. I guess it, that's fine, but also I kind of miss the idea of these horror movies set sometime in the distant past. Um, I don't think you could make a story like this set in modern times because everyone's reactions to the situations they were in would be completely different. You wouldn't be able to tell the same kind of story. So The Witch kind of shows that you have to sometimes go to the past to tell certain tales within horror and explore certain ideas you wouldn't be able to explore in, in the same way today. So um, basically it's set in New England um, during the time of the settlers, I think it's like the 1600s. 
a family is banished from their town and they have to go off into the wilderness to set up their own farmstead. But where they live is on the outskirts of a really ominous looking forest. And I just love the shots of the forest. You get these like ominous wide angle shots of the forest looming in the background with this creepy atmospheric music over the background. And the, the music really plays a massive part in this film as well. The building of this paranormal suspense. And there's just this idea that they shouldn't go into the forest. There's something bad in the forest. And then things start going wrong. And similar to what I was saying about Day of the Dead. It's this idea of seclusion and mental strain. How it takes a toll on the family and how they start to turn on each other. And it's just this like tight-knit little family drama. Almost like... I don't know, the Waltons or something like that, but things start going wrong, the, the crops start to fail, a child goes missing, and again, this creeping paranoia, this sense of dread, it all builds up in the background. It's all intermingled with the family's own superstitions and religion about the devil and witchcraft. I don't want to sort of spoil what happens in the movie. I think it's just one of them ones you have to go and watch. I found it quite difficult to get into at the beginning because all the dialogues in all the English type of talk it's it's quite hard to keep up with what they're saying I found but that's part of it it feels really authentic like the dialogues authentic and their beliefs and everything it all feels very real it also does a good job of turning completely innocent things quite sinister for example the two twins the, the small children they're singing nursery rhymes and they've got this goat which they call Black Philip and they're singing nursery rhymes about this goat and how it kind of affects the mental state of the family and how it it's just an innocent rhyme but it kind of starts to sound a bit sinister the more the the plot unfolds and yeah it's it's actually quite a hard movie to talk about without giving too much away it actually reminds me a lot of the Mythago Wood books by Robert Holdstock it's got that kind of atmosphere, someone living on the outskirts of a mysterious wood and within the wood there's sort of strange secrets going on. Like I say, I can't say too much about it, but I can recommend it. So uh, yeah, if you get a chance, watch it definitely. And give it a go, even if you find the dialogue a bit difficult at first, I, I did myself, but um, just, just keep at it. You kind of get into the mode where you can take on board what they're saying as, as the film goes on. So for my next movie, I'm going to pick one from 1988. And this was made in Hong Kong. It's called The Men Behind the Sun. This one's a difficult watch. One that I've seen quite a few times, but it's it's not an easy watch. I've got to give it that. It's, um, it's kind of regarded as an exploitation movie because of how ridiculously gory it is. But it also has quite a, a serious message behind it. Quite an important message. And I think... It's so violent and over the top. I think maybe the message gets a little bit lost along the way. The whole plot of the movie is based on what happened in Unit 731, which was a biological experimentation facility owned by the Japanese during World War II. And they'd basically take in Chinese prisoners of war, take them into this lab and carry out all kinds of horrific experiments on them. And the movie, a lot of it is just focusing in graphic detail on these experiments and it's it's absolutely horrible to watch in a lot of places there's one where they freeze a woman's hands and then they like dip it into boiling water and then rip all the skin off her hands just leaving the bare bones on the ends of her arms there's one where they put a guy into this pressure chamber and turn the pressure up so high that his intestines come out through his anus and this is all shown in graphic detail there's actually quite a number of rumours about this film, about how it could actually be a snuff film, and from watching it, some of the effects are so realistic, it could be. There's a bit where a boy is cut open and he's got his heart taken out while it's still beating. I mean, I think the filmmakers always maintain that these are all special effects, but the effect of taking the beating heart out of the chest cavity of a person is so realistic, I can't really see how they would have done it without actually killing a person, but... I don't know, maybe they did, maybe they used a, an animal or something, I'm not sure, it, but it that kind of gives you an idea of how graphic the movie is. I actually, I think I read somewhere that they actually used body parts from a nearby morgue to get a lot of the effects, but I think it's one of those movies that's got so many 
different controversies surrounding it that it's it's quite hard to get the truth there's quite a few scenes where animals are possibly abused there's definitely a, a scene where there's rats that are set on fire and I guess that must have been real. Um, there's one scene which is really difficult to watch and it goes on for far too long where a cat is thrown into a, a tank full of rats and then the rats slowly eat the cat to death. Apparently the filmmakers said that really they just smeared some kind of treacle onto the cat and the rats were just eating that. So maybe it's not really that bad but I, I still find the scene really horrible to watch. You want to watch something extreme, I, I definitely pick Men Behind the Sun. These movies from China and Hong Kong have a certain aesthetic to them, especially the ones from the 80s. A grimy, slightly cheap feeling to the whole movie, but that kind of adds to the atmosphere of it. Everyone's stuck in this horrible facility and they're just treated so badly. You get the sensation that some of the stuff you're watching could be real as well, given the budget that they had to make the movie. It just adds to the sort of sickly feeling you get from watching it. I think you've got to be in the right mood to watch this one. I don't know if this will be a recommendation for everyone, but if you haven't seen it and you like cannibal holocausts and your faces of death, things like that, you'll probably enjoy this one as well. It's, it's definitely well, worth a watch. As the end credits roll past, you get a little bit of history there. And But the thing is, the movie, it's it's designed to shock you as much as possible. I guess it kind of leaves you feeling overwhelmed by the end of it because you've witnessed so many atrocities. There's the idea that this actually happened in real life and there's far more that actually happened that wasn't actually shown in the movie. So, yeah, it's it's got an important message behind it. It's a decent watch. If you're into your extreme gore, then, uh, yeah, I can recommend this one. Okay, the next choice is going to be another Asian movie. Um, this one comes from Japan made in 1999. It's Audition by Takashi Mike, who's quite well known for making extremely violent, sick movies. Itchy the Killer is another one of his. If you've seen that, you might know what to expect from this one. So yeah, I've got a kind of story behind why this one is on the list. I do have a, a very personal reason why this one sort of sticks in my head as a horror movie that particularly freaked me out. This went back to when I was in university and probably wasn't as responsible as I am these days. When I was that age I kind of liked to experiment with various different things and uh, my friend had Hawaiian baby wardrobe seeds which contain an ingredient called LSA which is kind of similar to LSD but apparently the trip can be a lot more difficult for people so uh, yeah me and my friends chomped down a bunch of these seeds just just because we were young and stupid and trying to have a good time after a while nothing really was happening we decided to put on audition and uh, this was just happened to be on the TV at the time I think and I, I didn't know anything about this movie I was like oh you know this looks interesting I'll watch it and this is another movie that I can't tell a lot about without spoiling it but let me just say the first two thirds of the movie are just a pleasant love story about a guy who holds an audition with the ulterior motive of finding himself a partner. As the movie's going on the the uh, seeds we took were slowly starting to take effect and we were starting to feel a bit funny. Just as the LSA started to kick in really hard, just as we started to peak, the movie takes a massive twist. The whole tone of the movie changed to full-on horror, and it's like a torture horror. It's absolutely horrific. There's so many images in the film that are like now embedded in my mind because, you know, we're just sit sitting there having like a, a kind of weird experience, slightly trippy. And then all of a sudden we're plunged into this nightmare world where people are getting like needles stuck in their eyeballs and there's one bit that sticks out in my head where there's a guy getting his, his head sewn off with this metal wire put around his neck and it's being pulled back and forth and slowly sawing off his neck and the, the sounds of it going through his throat were so embedded in my mind that I, I like I had to get out of the room because I tried like looking away but just the sounds of it sawing through his neck were so realistic to me. Just as I was starting to peek that sound just sent me like running from the room. 
I, mean, I think I came back in and watched the end of it, but it really left me in a really bad state. It, it sent me on such a bad trip that the movie is now kind of embedded in my head. Um, I remember I couldn't sleep that night. My friend who was also watching the movie with me went back to his room and he was like being sick. We both had like this really terrible night afterwards. And um, I remember for like maybe a week afterwards, I just felt really off, like off kilter. It was like I was getting flashbacks to the movie. If I saw a girl who looked like the girl in the movie, I'd suddenly get like a mild panic attack. Uh, eventually it went away and I, I have watched the movie since and it didn't have the same effect on me. But it's still a really good movie. I can recommend it. You might not get the same effect that I've got, but I wanted to put it on this list just because of, of that story. I, I kind of wish I could recommend a movie and tell you about it without telling you how the pacing of the film works, but I couldn't really describe my experience of it without revealing that. I don't know, I think it might be because of the change in pace at the end of the film. I think because of the, the first part of the movie has built you up so much that the ending is so much more shocking. You know, if it was just a full-on torture porn movie from start to finish, I don't think it'll have the same effect. So, uh, yeah, Audition, definitely recommend that one. The final movie I'm going to pick, and this is just because I watched the recent BBC adaptation of Dracula, and I was so appalled by it. Oh, they butchered it so much. Honestly, they, they, they did such a bad job of it that um, I had to go back and watch an old classic just to, just to sort of cleanse myself of the... The horrors of the BBC version. So my next recommendation is Nosferatu, the original silent version. Yeah, 1922, absolute classic. From comparing it to a modern adaptation where they've got all the budget, all the special effects, all the CGI and everything, and just being able to mess up the story so much that it really brings the whole thing down to so going back to the real bare bones of the story. You know, they didn't even have sound back then. The, some of the special effects are so terrible, but the fact that they still managed to effectively invoke a sense of horror into the movie, I think it's really important to look back on these things and see how they did it, because these modern adaptations, they miss so much out. So this movie does two things really well that I think they leave out of quite a lot of Dracula adaptations. The first one is... Dracula himself, or Count Orlok, as he is in this movie. A lot of modern versions of the Dracula story, Dracula's always seen as this quite charismatic, attractive character. He's a, la a real ladies' man. He's got this kind of mysterious, sexy vibe to him. And what I don't see conveyed often enough is the underlying animal nature of him. The only other movie that I've seen that does this quite well, the movie called Bram Stoker's Dracula by Francis Ford Coppola. I think that also has this sort of idea that underneath Dracula is like this horrible, inhuman monster. In Nosferatu, you, you never see the kind of sophisticated side of Dracula. He's just pure animal evil throughout the movie. He looks like a rat, and the image of the rat is used continuously throughout the movie. The fangs aren't at the sides on his canines like they are in most movies. It's his two front teeth that stick down like a rodent's and he's got these horrible pointy ears and this hooked nose and the whole look of him, the way he holds his hands and the way he, the way he moves his body, it just gives this kind of alien, inhuman look to him. They also did this quite well in the recent It movie. You know, he, he looks like a human, Pennywise the clown, but the way they had him move his body, you kind of tell that he's he's not human. He's, he's There's something alien and unnatural about him. And I, I think also they did this so well in Nosferatu is the way he holds his hands and moves around and when he rises up out of the coffin, the whole vibe of Nosferatu, there's something off about him. And being able to convey that in a, a silent movie is a really good achievement. The other thing that I, I always think they miss out on in a lot of Dracula adaptations is the idea of Dracula having this exterior power to him. It kind of goes out in front of him. It's kind of like if you've ever watched the Moomins with the Groke character, there's this big monster thing that wherever it's going, it gets cold there before the Groke arrives. As if it sort of sends out this wave of cold energy ahead of itself. 
suddenly it goes cold and you know that the grog's going to arrive any minute and it's the same with dracula dracula sends out this like evil energy his his thoughts go ahead of him and they sort of send this evil influence so like in this case he's he doesn't go back to england he goes back to germany in uh, some town called visborg but ahead of him as he's traveling there his evil influence kind of travels ahead of him and starts to infect the minds knock is the equivalent of renfield in the original story the one who goes mad with the evil influence of the vampire even before he's set foot on shore the influence of the vampire is taking hold in people's minds and i think this is one of the best versions of sh showing that element of dracula it shows that his power is not just contained within himself it kind of goes out ahead of him it's like a, a big cloud of evil Dracula's more than just the, the figure you see. I don't think a lot of movies do that very well in showing that aspect of Dracula. And it's something that I always thought was quite important to the story. And uh, I think Nosferatu does that really well. There is quite a lot of faults with the movie. I think in the intervening years between this being made in the 1920s and modern day, I think there's so many things that we've learned in movie making that they didn't know back then that it's quite glaring. For example, I, th I think the idea of telling a story without showing it wasn't really too well known back then. I think there's quite a lot of scenes which you could just exclude completely from the story. For example, when the Nosferatu arrives in the town, there's a scene of him walking through the town to the place where he's going to live, carrying the coffin in his arm, <laughs> like someone carrying a suitcase. And uh, it just it makes Count Orlok look too human. I, and I think you could just show the ship arriving in the port and then him later looking out the window of his place you wouldn't have needed to show the the in-between parts there's a lot of dodgy special effects there's a lot of stop motion that is not done too well it's very obviously stop motion and it, it just it just doesn't look good in my opinion it adds a certain charm to the movie but with the benefit of hindsight of 100 years of filmmaking these things really stand out there's a lot of day for night shots where Dracula's supposed to be walking around at night and it's clearly the middle of the day, the sun's beaming down. Back then, I guess they just couldn't film outdoor shots at night. It was probably impossible with the cameras that they had. A lot of the acting is also a bit corny looking. They, they kind of tend to overact. It's very theatrical. I guess a lot of the acting came from the theatre where they had to exaggerate their movements and their facial expressions to show what they're feeling so that the people at the right at the back of the auditorium would be able to get what emotions they were trying to convey so i guess when they started making movies they thought they had to over exaggerate in the same kind of way but this isn't necessarily a bad thing for the movie it kind of gives everyone a, a slightly uncanny valley type of feel to them everyone feels slightly unnatural it's not just dracula actually it's everyone feels kind of a bit off and a bit slightly creepy the faces are all really painted up theatrically and they've all got these really white faces with dark eyes and they all look kind of a bit corpse like they look like painted corpses and they've all got these creepy rictus grins on their faces the whole time there's just so many visuals in this film the use of the shadows the, the clawed hand of dracula as he reaches for the heart of the the Mina Harker character. I can't remember what her name is. Ellen, that was it. Yeah, I remember now. Ellen was the name of the character. As he reaches up and clutches at her heart with his shadow. The images of the rats coming out of the boxes. When Hutter is in Dracula's castle and he opens the door and he just sees Dracula standing in the shadows with his eyes glowing out of the, out of the darkness, just staring at him. The way they managed to do it without any sound design because sound design is so important in horror movies these days it's so effective I, I think i think you should give it a go and just try and get over the hokiness i think it takes a while to get going i think up until hutter reaches the castle and is led inside that's kind of where the film picks up its pace it just starts to get really creepy from there on out it does so much with so little this film all the all the visuals of the castle itself like the way when uh, Hutter's walking around and he's he's always framed by some like oppressive archway or something it gives you the feeling that he's he's always like enclosed by the castle in some way it's, it's really clever all the framing of the shots well, like when Dracula leads him into the castle and he's it's kind of like he's been swallowed up by this 
big yawning mouth it's it's well worth watching just for these few visual shots that have so much impact that's my five recommendations for today if you like this then let me know and I'll do another one. I've got loads of movies that I can recommend. That's not like my top five. It's just five that came to mind. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Whether you agree or disagree, that's all fine. And whether you liked this video, if you'd like to hear more recommendations, then uh, let me know that as well. So thanks for watching. If you want to help support the channel, you can check out my Patreon. $2.50 a month and for that you get access to my videos 24 hours before they go live on YouTube. And also you'll be helping to support the channel and keeping me going. Okay, catch you next time. Goodbye.